So the title of today's message is, His Grace is Enough. It is finished. And that was the last thing that Jesus said on the cross right before he died. It is finished. He spoke that because the price had been paid at that time. At that point in time, the price for every sin that would ever be committed by anyone was paid for then and there. It was done. There would be no more blood sacrifices. The ultimate sacrifice had been made. And um, the Lord showed me uh, a while ago, and I, I shared it once before, that I didn't fully understand the brutality of the crucifixion initially, why it had to be so horrendous. Because you know, we know Jesus gave his life for us. He went willingly. But the crucifixion was just so, just so terrible, you know, such a torturous way to die. And what God showed me was that was to pay the price for every sin, no matter how horrific a sin. We don't understand that in our human mind. I mean, there are certain sins that man commits that we feel let them go straight to hell. Um, there are certain sins, I, I won't glorify the devil, but, but we know, we, you know, we have access to the internet and the news and some of the horrible things that people are capable of doing. Even those horrific sins, if they accept the gift of salvation, they are forgiven. And again, in our understanding, in our flesh, we don't understand that, but that is what grace is. Grace extends beyond what we understand. The points I'm going to cover this morning, our salvation comes through grace. Through grace, our sins are continually forgiven. Grace is not something that we should ever take advantage of or take for granted. Grace enables us to not sin. Through grace, God strengthens us. Through grace, God enables us with spiritual gifts. Our salvation comes through grace. When we answer an altar call for that first time, anyone who, who wants to ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, to be Lord of their life, I know for me, I thought it was, my understanding was I was making this commitment that from now on I'm going to be good. From now on, I'm going to be a good person. From now on, I'm going to get it right. That that step up to the altar, that that was my commitment. I didn't really fully understand that I was receiving a gift that was being given to me by grace. There was nothing that I could ever do, nothing that you could ever do, that could earn us a place in the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't matter how good we might be. Um, we've all heard of Mother Teresa, a wonderful, amazing woman. She did tremendous things for the poor. But only through the blood of Jesus Christ was she saved. It wasn't the things that she did. Now, our, our works, um, let me just go to the, this, uh, the first scripture, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not from ourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. So no one can say, you know, I'm a Christian because I'm all that in a bag of chips. I mean, none of us, none of us, no one in this room um, is worthy. In Romans, um, similarly, 11, 5, and 6, so too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace and if by grace, it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Many religious movements still teach that we have to earn our way into heaven. We're doing things to earn our way into heaven. Um, people will crawl you know, up a mountainside and do all kinds of things. That type of thing, and I, I don't want to offend anyone, I don't want to insult anyone, but that's offensive to God. I mean, Jesus Christ gave his life and died in the most brutal fashion to pay for our sin. For us to say that that's not enough is offensive to God because it's more than enough. He paid the price. We cannot, we can't earn it. 
There's nothing we could do. Now, the works that we do, um, the word talks about we're, 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 we're being given crowns, if you will. Um, you know, as we do good works, we are being given crowns in the spiritual realm. Those crowns are for us to lay at the feet of Jesus when we get to heaven. And I do believe for those who've really sold out for God and done tremendous things in his name, that there will be levels in heaven, that there will be, um, you know, different, um, you know, and, and we will be doing things in heaven, uh, first and foremost, worshiping God, but we will be rewarded in heaven, shall I say, for um, the things we've done. But again, those things that we do do not get us into heaven, and our sin does not keep us out of heaven, because if we confess our sin, he forgives us. Um, so that's the next point that I wanted to make. Through the same grace by which we're saved, our sins are forgiven when we confess them to him. In 1 John 1 to 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You know, the comparison I'd like to make this morning um, between Peter and Judas Jesus himself had said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. Jesus himself said those words. And then he said to his beloved disciple Peter, before the cock crows three times, before the rooster crows, excuse me, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Um, or you'll, um, I mean, <laughs> you're going to deny me. <laughs> and he did. Um, and... So basically, I mean, Peter, not only did he say he didn't know Jesus to save his own skin, but in case they didn't believe him, he cursed and carried on to prove he was not a believer. I mean, he really went out of his way to not only deny him and say, I don't know him, but I'm not even like him. I'm not a follower of him. Don't think for a second that I know this man, right? But we know that Peter is in heaven today, don't we? We know that God forgave him. Now, the difference between Peter and Judas, when as soon as Peter heard the rooster crow that last time, he wept. And it was tears not of self-pity. He recognized what he had done. He remembered what, had ha what Jesus had told him. He remembered those words, and he wept because he was repentant. He was deeply sorry. He was very sorry for what he had done. Now, we obviously know then that he received forgiveness. Now, what Judas did, because in the eyes of God, all sin is the same, so what Judas did was of the same level, and yet we know that he went off and killed himself. Now, I'm not going to say where he is today because only God really knows but we can see the parallel. One man received forgiveness and went on to do great things for God, and another man died, died a horrific death. Um, and, you know, again, at that point when he was falling before he hit the ground, if he repented and said, God, I'm sorry, what have I done? I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there. So, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say where he is, but I know the difference. One had a legacy. You know, one served God to the bitter end, and one offed himself, basically. So um, going back to if we confess our sins, because we get saved and we're covered, right? We're covered by the blood of Jesus and our old nature dies. But there's a lot left over in us. There's a lot of compulsions and you know, thought patterns and just things in us that are sinful. They're, we're not perfect. There's not one person who comes to the Lord, gets saved, and then walks away, and now from now on, they're perfect. They, they don't lose their temper. They don't um, ever tell a lie. I mean, you know, if you, listen, if you eat someone's food and you think it's nasty and you say, oh, that was delicious, that's a lie. That's a sin. <laughs> You know, so, I mean, again, we, we tend to think of, you know, or, oh, you look great in that dress. I mean, that's a lie. Um, and, and again, not to say we should go around offending one another, but, but you know, just to keep it real, it's, I, I think sometimes for some of us, we, 
we forget that we are, and I, I'm going to say again, one of my favorite things about Pastor Joel is he always keeps it real and he's very transparent about himself. And it makes me feel like, wow, you know, okay, um, you know, I'm struggling here or there, but I know, I know, I know as long as I bring it before God, as long as I confess those sins, um, he is faithful to forgive me. And it's important for all of you, you know, if someone comes to you and says, I'm struggling, because I believe the reason we have the issues in the world today with sexual perversion is because nobody would in, within the church would ever say, I'm struggling in this area, because they'd be judged. They would be judged. So pe nobody, nobody wants to say anything. Nobody wants to speak, you know, no one wants to. So, so what happens is the world embraces all these mindsets. The world says, come on, welcome, parade it around, let's go, you know, it's great, come on, you know, be yourself. Because the church turns our back on not just the sin, but the sinner as well. So we have to be so careful remembering all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And just because for one person, they, they have a weakness in one area, another person has a weakness in another area, it doesn't make one person better than the other. And it's, it's important for us to, to remember that um, when we're dealing with one another within the body of Christ. Now, by the same token, that grace that God bestows on us should never be used as an excuse for us to keep on sinning. There's a lot of churches out there right now, especially coming up out of Hollywood. You know, people get famous, they have a gift, they have a talent, they can sing a song, they can write a song, and suddenly they're representing a particular church and they're representing God. And a lot of young people are drawn to that because, oh, this cool person now is, is holding a church service. And the message of grace as long as we repent of our sin, and we have to allow ourselves to be convicted, there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And absolutely, it's the love of God that brings us to repentance. It's his love, it's his love that brings us to repentance. But it's not to say, it's all right, do what you want. God understands, you know, there's grace, there's grace, there's grace, you're forgiven, do whatever, you know, act any kind of way. Um, and, and I go back to the celebrities who, I mean, I've seen things on TV where they're, they're holding hands and praying before they do a concert, and the concert is going to be, you know, in no way representing God. And then they give God credit when they get an award, you know, for, for, for these songs that they're singing and the way they're behaving. And, you know, it's kind of like, do me a favor, like, don't, you know, <laughs> don't say anything, because that's... Listen, again, God loves us so much that he wants to bring us out of our sin. He wants to bring us out of our sin. It's not condemnation, it's conviction. You should feel uncomfortable. You know, there are times if you go to a place, and sometimes it's unfortunate, sometimes you may be uncomfortable with your own family, your loved ones, you feel out of place, you wanna belong. You want, I mean, we all, we all want to be loved. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to be different. We don't want to be the weirdo. But you know what? The word says we're a peculiar people. We are different. We shouldn't laugh at the same jokes. You know, we have to remember Jesus is with us always. He's always with us. And there are certain behaviors that the word clearly says are not of God. And again, do we condemn anyone? No, we love, we embrace. But, you know, the sin is the sin is the sin. It's, you know, the, that doesn't change. That doesn't change. It's just the world is changing. The world is changing. And so because the world is changing, it doesn't mean that now we must advance in our thinking. You know, the, the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you know what? Sin was the same yesterday, today, and forever. They were doing all kinds of things in the Roman bathhouses and in ancient Greece. I mean, it's not like suddenly there's this new, you know, this new thing that, that's come up. Um, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. It's, it's there. But now, 
now there's a, there's a drive for us to be in agreement with it, for us to accept it, for us to say, yes, I agree with you. You know, what you're doing is right. I'm in agreement with you. I'm lined up with you. We can't do that. Again, we're not called to condemn anyone. And I don't know that, you know, especially within, within the church, certainly. I mean, if you know a brother or a sister who's living in a particular lifestyle and they're in denial, don't go into denial with them. You're not doing them a favor. You know, you have to tell that person in love, you know, this is really, this is not of God. I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you. Um, but again, don't, you know, don't, um, how can I say, deny the existence of sin or wink at sin. You know, God does not say, oh, it's okay. You know, I understand it's cool. It's all right. Um, and again, there's a... Um, there's, there's a lot happening today with the, the grace movement and the repentance movement. And, you know, they, they shouldn't be separate. They shouldn't be separate. And the word, you know, tells us, like, God sees our relationship with him. You know, he uses a marriage to compare. And if I say to Richie, okay, you know, I'm giving myself to you, and I'm your wife, and I'm going to marry you, but once in a while, you know, I want, I, I want to go to an expensive dinner, so, you know, I'm just going to go with some other guy, you know, who's got, you know, whatever, a fancy car and some, you know, but it's all right, right? I mean, but that's what we do with God. It's like, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, but you know what? I'm just going to go over here, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and, you know... Um, and again, because the world says it's okay, it's not, they're not smarter than us. They're not smarter than us. They're not more advanced than we are. And there is, again, a perception that's out there that we are backward people because we're thinking the way we're thinking. We're backward, we're ignorant. I mean, I, I happen to be a smart person, you know? I mean, I am, and I weigh everything, believe me, you know, I weigh everything, I bring it before God. I don't claim to know everything or to know, um, you know, especially when I read the Old Testament, sometimes I have a little hard time with that. But, um, but when you're born again, there's something in your spirit that says, you know what, that's the ultimate truth. My intelligence has to take a back seat sometimes because God knows better than me. And there's so many concepts of, you know, going back to grace, grace abounds. You know, we sin and grace abounds. Um, but like the word says, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under, under grace? Of course not. We shouldn't. We should, be, we should be striving to be better. And again, conviction, not condemnation, conviction. You should, if you're living, especially if you're living in adultery, if you're, if you're in a lifestyle that doesn't line up with the word of God, you should feel uncomfortable when you come to church because if you don't allow that conviction, if you don't allow that, what will happen is you will begin to harden your heart and that's how we backslide. That's how we backslide. You know, and those people who say, you know, they were going to church for a seat, like they were born again, da, 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 like as if they tried it out. I was thinking about, like Pastor Deborah said, these are people who had an experience with God, but not an encounter with him. Because once you have an encounter with God, once you become one with him, you don't want to sin. I mean, and again, there are some things that are harder to give up than others, and that's why there's grace. But we have to keep trying. We have to keep trying. We should be different. We should be growing. We should be changing. We should be, when we go out into the world, there should be something different about us. People, people should see something different about us. Does that mean we're carrying a Bible and again condemning everybody? No. It's the love of God that should be flowing. The love of God brings man to repentance. The love, the lo I can't stress the love, the love. That's how I got saved. It was his love. Because I already felt dirty. I already felt unworthy. I already felt unwanted. I, I, you know, I already had that. So if you were going to tell me more about how bad I was, I, I, you know, I would be running for the hills. Um, but the fact that God loved me, that God loved me, that just went so deep into my spirit, into my heart. 
That love is so powerful. And love, we love our children, but we don't let them do whatever they want, right? We love, you know, we love our spouses, but we don't let them abuse us. I mean, so love doesn't, you know, love does not mean compromise. Um, now, it's also through God's grace that we have the ability to not sin. You know, people say, oh, I can't help myself. That's just the way I am, right? That's just the way I am. You know, I, I always, I always overate. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to food. That's, you know, but what does the word say about gluttony? You know, what does it say? Or, you know, yeah, whenever I go to a party, I, you know, I got to unwind and, you know, yeah, I get drunk, you know, whatever, but it, it's a, that's what I always did. Well, but now, now you've, you've made this commitment to God and the word tells us that drunkenness is a sin. So, you know, or, oh, you know, God understands I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a human. I, I need to have a physical relationship. That's, that's the biggest one today, right? That, like, we are out of our minds to think that as adults that we can, with, that we can um, abstain from, from a physical relationship. But that's a lie. That's a lie from the enemy. It's a lie from the enemy. You know, we know what the word of God says about that. And to say, oh, I can't help myself. Well, you know, come on. I mean, do you walk into a store and you see something nice, you shove it in your pocket? Well, I guess if you're a kleptomaniac. But, um, but again, but now you can be delivered from that, even if you are a kleptomaniac. Um, but, I mean, but again, all things have been made new. So... It is grace that will help you in that area, but you have to ask for it because grace is like the pillar of fire um, at night and the, and the pillar of cloud by day that protected the Israelites. We can go in and out of that pillar. We can go in and out of grace. Excuse me, God, I'm going to go over here, you know, and now we're stepping out. God is not going to ever force himself on you. He is not going to force his will on you. He's not going to stop you from sinning. You know, when Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. So you should pray that every day. Lord, I pray for the strength to withstand so that I don't lose my temper with my coworker, so that I don't uh, get upset when I'm driving, so that I you know, so that I have peace and I don't get so anxious and, and, and you know, and, to, and, and allow fear to paralyze me. All of these things, he will help you. And all of, the, you know, grace is this constant, it's, it's a living part of who God is. So when you pray for things, it is grace that, that God provides to get you through. Um, He's, you know, un unless you get removed from this planet, there are going to be things in front of you that you're going to be tempted with. But again, he's given you the ability to withstand. And what happens is there's something about sin. You know, the more you do it, the, the stronger the compulsion will become. And the more that you abstain and, you know, and, and, and operate more... I don't want to say self-control. I mean, self-control is a fruit of the spirit, but it's, that's the thing. It's not flesh. It's not you controlling yourself, but with God, having the willingness to do the right thing, God will then strengthen you and give you the ability to do the right thing. So, um, again, we do have the ability. The word says in Romans 6, 14, sin no longer, um, so sin shall no longer be your master. Uh, because you're not under law, but you're under grace. So again, to say that this is the way you are, sorry, that, you know, <laughs> now you know the truth, now you know the truth, so um, don't be mad at me, you can be mad at God. You know, it's, we gotta change, we have to change, we have to be different. Um, if, you know, anyone who's been saved, you know, if you got saved a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if you're the same exact way doing the same thing, something's not right. You have not had an encounter with God because we change. Our nature changes. I mean, I think, I think we kind of remain, you know, there's certain things that, that I think are, are in our personality, the way God makes us, the way he creates us. But our, you know, our good parts 
are nurtured and magnified and the things in us that were not good and not of God, you know, he helps to eliminate. But we have to have a willingness to do that. Okay, through grace, God strengthens us and um, helps us in our time of need. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Um, have you ever gone through something in your life and when you come out of it, you think, how did I, how did I get through that? How did I make it through that? Oh my gosh, like I can't, I, whoa, you know, like that was, that was crazy. Um, that's grace. That's grace. And that's one of the things we have that the world doesn't have. You know, again, I think when we're new in our faith, we think, oh boy, all my troubles are going to go away and, you know, everything's going to be zippity doo dah. But very often we, we, have, we have new problems that come up. We have new problems that come up, but it's different how we deal with things, how we get through things. And there are things that God is going to allow, because sometimes we don't know the iniquity that's in us. The iniquity is, is that proponent to sin. You know, there, 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 you know, there's something maybe in you that sort of, like if you have a hard time telling the truth, that iniquity is there in you. And so God is going to put you in situations where maybe you're going to tell a whopper of a lie and you're going to be exposed, you know, because, you know, I mean, because he's going to allow these things to happen for your sake, not to punish you, not to hurt you, because ultimately he loves you. So he's going to allow things to happen so that, you know, you can get through and he's going to be there with you. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, my mother was in the hospital. She had been diagnosed with cancer and they were going to be releasing her basically for hospice care, meaning like in home, like we would have to get somebody in, you know, the home to be with her. Simultaneously, Richie was having knee surgery. Um, and literally while he was having his surgery, I'm on the phone with the agency that's going to be providing home care. My mother was in the hospital. They wanted to release her. You know, once the hospital decides there's nothing we can do for you, they practically put you out on the sidewalk. So they're calling me, like, when can you come and pick her up? Meanwhile, it's like, you know, as I said, he's... And then I have my laptop with me because I'm also trying to get work done because I'm a little, you know, a little bit of a workaholic. Um, and all this is happening at one time. And it's so funny because... Even as it's happening, I'm saying, wow, this is really intense to myself, you know, but, but God had me, you know, and, you know, let me just say also that, that my mother's the type of person that she didn't think she needed help. Why should she have help when, you know, I could do things because after all, I only work in Brooklyn a million hours a week and my husband just had surgery, but sure, I should be able to take care of her too. Um, so she didn't want anyone coming. So all of this was happening at the same time, um, but... As long as I stayed in the presence of God, I was okay. And that's what I mean also about that grace. We can step in and out of it. We can step in and out of it. If we start saying, oh my God, what am I going to do? Da, 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 and we start complaining and murmuring and getting ourselves all stressed out, we have stepped out of God's grace. Step back in. Step back in. And the first thing is you repent. God, I'm trying to take this on myself. I'm trying to carry a burden I was never made to carry. Step back into his presence, get back under his grace, and you'll find that you look back and you say, wow, how did I get through that? How did I get through that? Because he just makes a way where in the natural there is no way. You can have that peace in a storm. And I know, listen, I don't think there's one person in this room that would not rather just not go through the storm in the first place, right? I mean, we'd all love to be in the Garden of Eden forevermore and just have every need met and everybody get along with us and, you know, more money than we know what to do with and on and on and on. But, you know, there are people in the world who seem to have that, right? But do they seem happy? Do, you know, do they seem happy? I mean, I have yet to see 
in social media that, oh, here's this person and they have all this money and they look like a million dollars and they just have joy and peace and so on and so forth and they don't have a relationship with God. We, we have it. We have it. The, you know, this is the ultimate. If you're striving, if you think, oh, if only I had this, if only I had that, then I would be at peace, then I would be satisfied. You already have the ultimate thing. Those things that you're desiring right now that you think you can't live without, you can live without it. And, and in the right time, because I used to think also, if I accept where I am right now, well, maybe I'll just get stuck here. But that's a lie from the enemy. That's a lie from the enemy. Because God wants to prosper you. God wants to prosper you. And we have to be willing and obedient. So it's, it's, it's a relationship. So we have to do our part, and then God does his part. And going back again, grace will give us the strength and give us the ability to do whatever it is that's required of us, but we have to continually ask for it. We have to ask for, we can even ask for more grace. Ask for more grace. In Hebrews 13, 9, it says, don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial food, which is of no benefit to those who do so. And again, I don't know what kind of food these people were being told to eat, but aren't we all being told now, like all these vitamins and different things, that that'll do it, that'll give you peace. Well, and again, I'm all about nutrition, vitamins, we should take care of our bodies. But again, that's not where our peace is going to come from. That's not where our joy should be coming from. We should you know, be seeking after God first and asking for that grace to cover us. And then he'll guide us and direct us and show us which vitamins we should take and which food we should eat and what we should be doing to take the best care of the body that he created for us. So now I need more grace because my thing is not moving. Whew. See, thank you, Brother Rodan. Yeah, so through grace, we receive our gifts or our talents. And I'm going to have to read it from up here because down here is not happening. Romans 12, 3 to 8, by grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but think of yourselves with sober judgment. And I'm going to stop there for a second because Paul is even saying, by the grace given to me, now I'm going to speak into your life. I'm not going to speak into your life because I'm Paul and I, you know, and I'm this, that, and a third. By the grace given to me, I'm going to speak into your life. And he goes on to say, don't think more highly than you ought. Think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. And he goes on to talk about one body with many members, and in Christ, though, um, though many, we form one body, each member belongs to the other, and we have different gifts. Um, I've spoken about this before also. You know, sometimes we desire other people's gifts. We desire uh, to be more like somebody else instead of finding out where God wants to use us. It is by grace that... Pastor Pablo somehow works a full-time job six days a week, is a father to his children, a husband to his wife, a pastor to this church, goes and picks up food on Sunday morning through the grace of God and manages to have an incredible relationship with his God, an incredible relationship with the Lord. That's by grace. That's by grace. And he is a humble, humble man, and he would be the first one to tell you that he knows that it's of God. Uh, you know, Pastor Deborah and Pastor Felix, you know, tirelessly serving in the ministry. And both of them, again, working full-time jobs, commuting to work day after day, but they're available, they're available, they're available to serve the body, to serve the teens. And it's by, yes, and we should, we should appreciate them. We should appreciate them. We should appreciate, there's so many of you, and I, I, you know, I can't name everyone, but I, I see, and God sees you, you, how much you serve the body, how much love is in you. Um, 
It is by the grace of God. It's not like Pastor Pablo takes a magic potion or something and, you know, that's how he does what he does. The grace of God. The grace of God. And, you know, for some of you, oh, yeah, no, you know, I'm, I'm just not that, whatever. I mean, stop being, don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. Um, and, and I'm, you know, forgive me. Again, I don't want to offend anybody, but, but, we're not asking you to do anything in your own strength. We're not asking you to do anything in your own strength. But if you have a talent, if you have a gift, if you are breathing, <laughs> um, and, and, and the body has a need, you should be saying, here am I, and God, equip me. God will equip you. Listen, I came into a church where the, the predominant language is Spanish. It is by grace that I worship in Spanish. It is by grace. You know, I, again, I give God, I give God all the glory because I don't speak. And I, I was trying, at first I was trying to learn. I was, you know, listening to Duolingo. And, but of course, they just teach you, you know, how to order food in a restaurant, right? Um, <laughs> And I, you know, and sometimes with God, it's like, like Nike, just do it. So like, I'm up, like, okay, I'm listening, I'm listening. And now, you know, and again, I know it was rough in the beginning and you guys by grace, like didn't throw tomatoes at me, <laughs> but, but when we're willing and obedient, God will give that grace and make, make the way. So, you know, it doesn't, it's not like God is not going to give us what we don't need at a particular time. Um, um, God is not going to give you an outpouring of grace to serve in ministry if you're sitting on your couch watching TV day after day. It's, you know, God gives us the grace when we step out of our comfort zone and say, yes, Lord. That's, again, going back to our salvation. We were saved through grace we are given grace to enable us not to sin, and it's God's grace that enables us to serve him and to serve him to the best of our ability. We should be wanting to give, it, to give him our all. We should be wanting to do our best for him, whatever that is, whatever that is. That poor widow had, I don't know, a rusty old coin. That's all she had, and that's what she gave. Mary with the alabaster box, that was all she had. That box of perfume was everything. That was her worship. That was her worship. She just let go of everything she had. And, and I know that God blessed her, and I know that he provided for her for the rest of her life. The word doesn't say that, but we know God. We know how he is. We, we, we cannot... We cannot withhold from him, or we should not withhold from him. He doesn't withhold from us. Thank you for joining the NBMI experience today. Like, comment, and subscribe at www.facebook.com front slash NBMINY or our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com front slash NBMICHURCH. Also check out our new and improved website at www.newbeginningschurches.com. And finally, check out our new awesome church app, available on both Android and Apple platforms. Search your app store for NBMICHURCH and be blessed.